Okay, so hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Marek Novak and together with my colleague uh, Dushan Sharemka we will uh, tell you something about symmetric multiprocessing in, uh, in Amber. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, tell you something about myself and my colleague. So, um, I'm the author and maintainer of our message light library, which we will learn about later in my presentation. And my colleague Dushan is author and maintainer of uh, ERPC library, which we will also learn later about. Um, we are both uh, Linux enthusiasts and uh, we are working at Linux Semiconductors. So, uh, during uh, our presentation, uh, we will introduce you with SMET mode processing as we, uh, as we understand it, um, with uh, remote processing messaging in Linux kernel, then uh, with RP message light, which is an implementation for uh, optimized for real time operating systems for small devices, and uh, we will end with. Uh, Embedded remote procedure call library, which is there for um, making it easy to use AMD in your system. So, first of all, motivation. Why do you use AMD when there's SMB or symmetric multi processing? So, thanks to AMD, your system can be faster, of course, because there are multiple cores, can consume less power can be safer, it can be more, more secure. Um, now I will explain how this can be. So uh, all of this is due to the fact that not all CPUs in the system are treated equally. Um, the cores run independently on each other completely. They are not uh, uh, under the same operating system. Uh, they can have different operating systems, they can have different architecture, uh, it can be a dedicated DSP for some dedicated computation. And uh, as they are completely separate, uh, they can be used in, uh, the AMP can be also used in basic criticality systems, which means that on one core you can run Linux, which is not uh, certifiable, for example, for automotive applications, not yet. <laughs> and uh, on the on the other core, on, on the so-called AMD core, you can you can uh, run an Arcos, uh, which will take care of critical tasks in the system. So, uh, in order to, to to make the system work, you need to, the two parts of the system to communicate somehow. For this, uh, there is a shared memory and uh, two intercore interrupts. Um, one core is uh, so-called master, and uh, most of the time it takes care of uh, life cycle of the other core, which means that uh, it enables the core, um, it enables its uh, clocks, uh, power, and the core starts booting. Uh, in some scenarios, it also is able to, to change the firmware of the secondary core, but it depends uh, where is the secondary core pulling from, whether it is from DDR or from external quad SPI flash or, or something else. Um, so this is the concept. Another important thing is that in this system, or maybe this is getting a little bit specific uh, for the protocol which is, which is used, the RP message, but uh, generally, a uh, master is uh, managing the shared memory, so it, it's a master's role to, to enable clocks for this shared memory, to initialize it, and to initialize any, any data structures which are later used for, for the intercore communication. So, finally, um, RPMSG. So, RPMSG, or Remote processor Messaging, um, is a very thin layer. Uh, on top of uh, a transport layer, and it actually defines just a UDP-like header, which contains a source address, which is uh, an address of uh, an endpoint on uh, on the sender side, on, on the side which is sending the message, destination endpoint, which is uh, like a UDP port, again, on, but this time on the uh, 
on the side of, of, of the other core and uh, the other space of uh, source and destination is always local to the core. Uh, this can be done like this thanks to the fact that uh, RP message is point-to-point -point protocol. So always between one pair of uh, CPUs, uh, there is one instance of RPMSG. Then there is a reserve field which we will not talk about now. And then here is the length and the actual payload. And then, like this, uh, this is one buffer transfer during, communi uh, during communication. Um, yeah. So, uh, in uh, the beginning, RPMSG uh, used to have only one transport layer, which uh, was and still is based on uh, Vertio. Uh, this is the most uh, generic implementation, which is uh, currently used by the majority of, of uh, vendors which are supporting uh, RPMSG on their platforms. And initially, uh, support or maintainer was Bohan and Bohan. Uh, these days, uh, the maintenance was uh, is done by Bjorn Anderson from Linaro, and uh, he did uh, a lot of work. And between all the pitches, uh, one important thing I, I, I can see there is uh, he split the core implementation of RPMSG from from the transport layer so that it is possible to, to have different uh, transport layers. So not only Vertio can be used, but uh, any, any custom, custom way to transfer data can be used. Uh, for uh, Currently there is GLing and SMB, which are uh, ring buffer based uh, implementations of multi-processor communication. But it, this is uh, unfortunately by implementation mainly for Falcon platforms. So we are getting to the uh, state of RPMSG in, uh, in Linux kernel. So um, in Linux kernel there is an, uh, a thing which is called RPMSG bus, which is a virtual bus uh, to which um, the uh, uh, RPMSG devices are registered. So either it is a virtual RPMSG device, which is in uh, if you, if you check uh, the sources of, of uh, Linux, it's in the driver RP message, retire RP message bus of C. Um, or it can be GLink, which is in the same directory, just the name is different. Or SMD, which again is in the same directory, but there is this prefix uh, QCOM, which means pop. Um, once a device is registered, it uh, um, thanks to the probing mechanism, which is present in Linux kernel, uh, it gets probed in, uh, with, uh, with one of, uh, of the RP message drivers. Uh, there are several of them. Uh, one of them is called RP message car, which is uh, quite recent, and it uh, exports, actually, uh, the RP uh, device, or its endpoint, uh, that's, uh, that refers to the uh, UDP-like uh, header I, I shown you before. Uh, there was this uh, source and destination address. So, uh, so the one uh, address is exported to to uh, user space using a correct device, and it appears in slash dev slash rb message. Uh, and then you can write your own Python script which accesses this device and it will actually send the data through shared memory to, to the second, secondary core. Uh, this is one thing, how you can, uh, one way how you can leverage uh, AMP. Another way is uh, to leverage it internally in the kernel. So, uh, Qualcomm has this uh, SMP RPM, Resource and Power Manager, which actually uh, takes care of uh, of power management in the system and uh, in uh, in the host side uh, in the kernel, uh, there there is just an API and uh, the actual work when setting the uh, state or when when uh, 
changing pop frequency, etc., is done by the secondary core, and those commands are communicated through RPMSG to the other side. And last but not least, uh, there is also uh, uh, another RPMSG driver called Video for Linux, and uh, this one is used uh, by, well, as you can see, by, by Video for Linux framework and uh, what it does, uh, it sends uh, not decoded uh, uh, frames or pictures to the other core, then the secondary core takes care of, uh, of the decoding and uh, the raw, raw data are then sent back to the kernel and it's going to be used by, by the kernel. So the discrete Poseidon transform computation is not done here, but it's, it's done on the other other side. So we have actually here is um, floating, and this can be this can be regarded as power uh, management, which is a kind of critical part of, of the system. So it is again floating to the other core, but it can be regarded as as a mixed criticality kind of uh, way how to leverage our message. So this is currently in, in, in upstream. If um, if I zoom a little bit, uh, here we have the message bus. So I take this branch, and uh, under the RP message bus and virtual RP message, there is the virtual bus, which is again a virtual uh, bus, um, to which a virtual device is registered by a module called Remote Pro, and this module uh, takes care of uploading the firmware, firmware for, for the secondary core, and once uh, the firmware is loaded, um, it uh, parses a, a one portion of the firmware, where, and in this, in this portion there is a thing called resource table, in which uh, there are entries for, uh, for virtual devices. Once it finds this entry, it registers a device, which then gets brought with a Virtio RP message, um, this Virtio driver provided by Virtio RP message bus.c module, and then uh, this gets brought up, and you know the rest of the story. So uh, another way to um, to create. Uh, virtual device is to use a custom platform driver, which is not the most uh, beautiful way of doing things, but uh, there is a problem, and because of the problem, this is the reason why it's, it's, it can be also done like this. The problem is if you want your course to start completely independently, which means you don't want your Linux to start your secondary core, but you want uh, an early boot. Uh, by the secondary core, uh, for example, you, you you enable some device and you, you you need you need a very fast response, which uh, can be achieved by Linux, but uh, you would need really to, to tweak uh, the kernel to, to make the boot up time as small as possible. There there's a lot of effort done in this this way also. But if you wanted to take another way of uh, achieving this, you can you can leverage the AMD core and let it boot very fast take care of the critical parts of the system, and then um, you will those uh, Linux kernel, kernel start slowly, and uh, the AMD core is already taking care of everything. And during the uh, Linux kernel startup, this uh, custom platform driver uh, registers directly already existing virtual device which is already up. So it is not taken from, from the firmware file and the firmware, firmware file is actually not managed by a Linux kernel in this case. So this is another another use case. And now we get to the point where I will uh, try to explain a little bit how um, virtual works uh, so that and, and with um, with regard to RP message, so um, Virtio is quite complicated, but uh, uh, I will explain how, how it works and how uh, we use it with RP message. Uh, 
Is anybody here familiar with Virch.io? Just uh, hands up, so for me to, to know. Okay, so 27.5%. Uh, so, um, it's simple. Virch.io uh, contains um, a thing called Virch.Q and each uh, data structure and each word queue is composed of two ring buffers and uh, the magic here is that each of the ring buffers is single reader, single writer ring buffer so um, in the beginning um, this ring buffer let's say it's, it's full of, uh, of three buffers and uh, another thing I would like to point out is that uh, those ring buffers are actually used only to store pointer to the actual uh, container of the data. So there is a pool of buffers and then there are those two ring buffers containing just addresses, just pointers to, to those uh, members of the pool, of the pool buffer pool. So uh, when one side wants to send a message, it reads four bytes of this ring buffer to make things simple, which we can call allocation. Then uh, the payload, uh, the, of course the RP message header is written into the buffer and, and after that the actual payload is written into the buffer. And then the address of, uh, of this buffer is written into the avail ring buffer. <coughs> The reception side reads those four bytes, or reads out of the ring buffer, and get, gets to know the address of the of the buffer which was sent, but actually just the point was passed to the other side, and then it can do whatever is needed well, by this with this buffer. And once uh, the other side is done with that, it writes back the pointer to the used. Uh, ring buffer, we can call this deallocation of ring. Uh, this is quite an interesting uh, way of communication because you don't need any interpore locking during the, the communication. And uh, it's efficient because it's not just a ring buffer, because ring buffers, in this case, it would not be efficient to use a ring buffer because um, you would need to do a copy into the ring buffer in order to send the data and then you would need to read out the data byte by byte if you do not, not want any um, um, any locking. So uh, this way it's it's very very efficient and that, that's why Virtio is actually used for um, uh, for this multiple communication. And one important thing, it allows for zero copy. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, I, I will show the procedure here. Uh, there is a, an interrupt, but this is not uh, this is not mandatory. It can also work without the interrupt if the other core just calls, uh, but uh, which might look like a um, bad approach because well, it will consume a lot of power. But uh, with some architectures, it can be it can be the way to go. For example, there, there are those programmable real-time units from DI. Maybe you, you know about and usage of interrupts is limited there. So um, uh, again, I will just uh, uh, pass go through the process. So. Uh, Let's say Linux would like to send something to the remote core, so it reads out of the use ring buffer, it writes the header and the payload, then it, the data gets enqueued into the avail ring buffer, which is another ring buffer, this is shown by a different color, and then a uh, uh, an interrupt is triggered, and data, uh, the other core is notified, it reads the address from the avail ring buffer, and it passed it to some, some callback in, in the interrupt context. The, and then um, there might be some RPOS queue where, where the reference to a pointer to, to the buffer is, is put, and then uh, it can be consumed in, in for example, some RPOS task context. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, uh, the 
buffers can be freed later and out of order. And this also would be complicated, well, with a simple ring buffer it would be possible to, to even do a zero copy. Here it is possible to do zero copy and, uh, and deallocate or free the, buff the buffer once they are processed in out of order manner. And when, when the, the free happens, again there is a, there is a trigger, an, an interrupt to, to the other side so that the other side knows that, uh, for example, if, if this pool is depleted, uh, master would wait for an interrupt and once uh, a buffer is freed, an interrupt would be triggered and it would unblock it and continue. So this is how it works. Uh, when the communication is going from the other side, uh, it is completely the same, just uh, another, if you compare the pictures, just, uh, just the color change and then the sense of the arrows. Uh, it is now done in the same way, just uh, another pair of, uh, of ring buffers is, is used. So, uh, in total there are four ring buffers in the system, that, that's important. Now for our message slide. So, um, as I said, it's a very small uh, library, uh, which is it is constituted by those files you see. Um, there are some headers, but those are not very important. Uh, so there is this Arch message slide, Arch message queue, and Arch message name service. Uh, Arch message slide uh, provides uh, send API API for creation of new endpoint registration of new endpoint, etc. Our message queue, which is not mandatory, can be disabled, uh, or it is not mandatory to use it, provides uh, blocking receive, which might be useful if you use an Arcos. If you don't use Arcos, you can, you can just use an interrupt callback and that's it. But you don't see, it's, there's where the magic actually happens. Uh, it's the, it, it's a very lightweight implementation of uh, of uh, Vertigo protocol, as I described it, and then there, there are those two two layers. One layer for portation to, to the Arcos. Basically, there is just a very thin abstraction on top of Mutex, Semaphore, and Q, very thin. And then there, this uh, platform layer, which is used for portation to different platforms. Um, so, uh, like uh, there, there are interrupts platform dependent uh, things, but interrupts enabling, disabling, etc. Okay, and this name service I forgot about. Uh, this is used for uh, announcement of, uh, of uh, services to the other side, because uh, when the system boots up, uh, Linux doesn't know or may not know what uh, what firmware is loaded in the AMP core. So the AMP core uh, may send a message to a fixed endpoint address and uh, at, this, at that endpoint address uh, Linux is looking for a, a, a bucket which is formatted in a certain way where name, uh, uh, the compatible string is sent there and uh, the address of the newly created endpoint on the AMP side so that uh, dynamically uh, drivers in the Linux kernel can probe uh, with uh, like a new RP message device can be dynamic, dynamically created in this way. So the AMP core actually announces its capabilities. But uh, this approach is not mandatory again, it can be done in any other way. So as, as I said, it's, there are two portations layer, it's quite simple and it's BSD licensed, so you can go and Use it. There is a Triarcos port, Bermetal port, and Zephyr port is uh, in progress. And if you would like to look at the code, it's it's hosted at GitHub under an XP micro slash message like. And uh, now let me pass the ground to my colleague Dushan, who will present to you something, who will tell you something about the very remote procedure call. Uh, I have a question, yeah. Uh, address? Yeah, uh, you mean here with the name service? Uh, well, uh, Linux 
needs to know to what address send or, or with whom to communicate. Because one thing is he would send some some packet, but when he doesn't know that the firmware, for example, provides some discrete cosine transform service, uh, he would not no, not know where to send the messages or what, what is the purpose of the firmware actually. So either something is there is some entry in device tree or uh, it can be done this way dynamically. There is no broadcast, no. Yes, yes. It's like UDP. There are no connections. There, there's no UDP and... Yeah, yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. On both sides it's like, like UDP. You just... Uh, it's uh, uh, fire and forget. You just send, send a, a packet and you don't know what happens. But, uh, well, it isn't in the same SOC, so likely uh, will not be dropped or anything, but it depends on the implementation that happens in the, the Arduino system. So, uh, let me pass the mic to, uh, to Dushan. Thank you. Hello everybody. Do you know something about the uh, RPC? Um, <laughs> it's a uh, commonly it's known in the world. So I will start uh, just uh, quickly what RPC is, um, why we are developing the RPC, and uh, how to use our ERPC. So uh, what is RPC? Uh, RPC is a mechanism to evoke software routine on the remote system as a simple local function call. Uh, remote system can be any CPU connected uh, through communication channel uh, like uh, servers across network or another CPU with multiple system. For uh, users, it looks like uh, calling local function uh, from a library built into application. Uh, RPC is uh, type of clean server uh, request response type of communication. Uh, here I have an uh, example. <coughs> so an uh, application on the clean side will call a uh, remote function. Uh, data are passed to start flow, which can be written <coughs> or uh, generated. And uh, in here are data serialized, put to transport and sent to server side. Uh, server will deserialize uh, code in server stack code, uh, serial deserialize data, and up call appropriate function uh, with uh, this data. If there is expected any return values, uh, these are again serialized, sent uh, to client, deserialized, and uh, written to application. Uh, and here is the RPC time. Okay, so why we are developing the RPC when there are exist uh, RPC solutions already? You could uh, see some presentations already here. Uh, so uh, many of uh, these uh, RPC modern uh, solutions are based for uh, distribution, high performance distributed systems. Uh, communicating over the network. Uh, we are focusing on tightly coupled systems uh, uh, using uh, C, uh, program language um, with small code size. Uh, for multiprocessors, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, SPI transport and UR transport and some others. For uh, multi core, we are supporting RP message, which was presented uh, by Marek or uh, MU, which is using uh, registers to communicate between cores. <coughs> so, what are um, main uh, requirements? As I said, uh, it's small code size. Uh, 
I'll be silly guy in his uh, less than five kilometers. Uh, main program language. Uh, so we, need, uh, we are supporting C mainly to call RPC calls. Uh, we can use C or Python. Uh, in future, there can be others. Uh, we are not forcing users to use a particular uh, API style. Uh, stuff code uh, is generated. Uh, it can be run on bare metal, Linux, or uh, uh, cost. We are considering uh, porting to Zephyr. Uh, it's modular and simple, and it's uh, open source. So, how to use uh, ERPC in uh, applications? Uh, I can explain on the example. Let's say uh, we have dual core device. Uh, on one core we have uh, Linux, which is using for uh, what you want the uh, app server or play media application. Or, yeah. uh, and you have a uh, radio transceiver, and you want to uh, use it uh, uh, for quickly communication through it. Uh, so you can have another core uh, which will communicate through this uh, radio transceiver and you want to communicate between uh, this Linux core and this uh, uh, second core so you can use a uh, ERPC uh, and what do, you, well, what do you need to do? Sorry. Uh, as I said uh, Stuff code is generated. So first, uh, you need to define uh, your interface you want to use, and you need to define it in, the, it in the ideal file, which is using a, a interface definition language, uh, which we designed to be similar to C. But as you see, uh, you need to provide some more information uh, to let uh, us know uh, how the data should be serialized because it's not always obvious from function declaration. So uh, here is the idea <coughs> definition, and here is generated code. This is just a header file. Uh, there is, some, uh, of course, uh, more code, but uh, this is what the real user would uh, call in his application. So you can compare it, that it's uh, kind of similar. So when you have uh, this ideal file and you will generate your stuff code, then uh, it's everything uh, you need to add. You need to create your application. So uh, what you need to do then in your application on the client side, you need to initialize the RPC, and then you need to call your RPC functions, uh, and then just initialize uh, in the end. Uh, on the server, uh, you also need to initialize RPC and then register services. Uh, one service is one defined interface. Uh, and then you need to run RPC server. You can use run function or pull function. Uh, it depends if you want to call or handle just a one RPC call and then the, uh, use your another code, so you can use the thread for uh, execution uh, some other user code, or you, can, you want to just uh, handle uh, RPC calls. And when you are done, uh, just initialize RPC. So uh, that's uh, everything for me. Uh, if you have any question for me or Marek, you can ask uh, here. We have uh, our repositories for projects and uh, contacts. If you have any question, you can send us email. You can contribute if you will, you will be interesting, interested in these projects. So. So thank you for your attention. So are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in this case, 
if you put a pointer to data, uh, data will be deserialized, uh, not the pointer to the other side, but to rule data. There will be a copy down actually. Yeah, but the, as, as the uh, communication can be done, or we are mainly focusing on multi-core communication, there is a possibility to pass just pointers. But uh, of course, when you communicate over Spark, this is not possible to, yeah. But, but, Yeah, this is a problem which is to be solved in RP message as well. And yeah, <laughs> so so uh, ERPC depends on RP message and multi-core communication. So, but those are physical addresses for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can find your own uh, data types. Uh, and uh, put it uh, into your functions declared, you declare, and uh, these uh, structures will be also deserialized how you uh, declare. Uh, well, RPC, currently RPC is going through structure and serialize the data exact uh, size. Yeah. So, here we are supporting input, also output, and the hypermetics. You have very pertinent questions. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, any other? Uh, I wanted to return just the previous uh, question. Uh, currently, for uh, we also su are supporting annotation. Uh, we are calling this uh, annotation to add some more information. Annotation shared where you can send the exact pointer address from one side to the other side, so the data are not. Serialized to the pointer. So that's the more curious question. But it's uh, in developing stage. Yeah, well, there's quite a lot of things to consider in uh, embedded RPC. For example, we, we've been implementing uh, lately uh, nested calls that you can nest back and forth, which uh, uh, is quite interesting because then, uh, well, the aim of the game is to take some stack and uh, really provide just, for example, a socket API to the other side and let the whole stack run uh, on, on the game the core, for example. And uh, when you do this, sometimes uh, by the design of, of, of the stack or the library, you would need nested calls back and forth, so we also support this. This is a way to edit. Yes? Uh, so, so, sorry, if uh, yeah, if if one core crashes, what would we? How do we handle that? That's a good question. Um, in uh, again, uh, this is uh, something which is uh, not yet well handled in uh, in the G. So, uh, in for NXP platforms, we have something called the multi-core manager, where we take care of these. Uh, but this is mainly used for multi-core microcontrollers. In case of Linux, uh, where, where there is a, like, a microcontroller and Linux core, uh, this is very hard to handle uh, in, in kernel. And it, it is to be solved. There are regular meetings with, uh, or calls, uh, held by OpenAMP uh, group each uh, Thursday, uh, our time from 9, 9 p.m. So. If you have any, uh, if you are interested in, in the RP message project or in AMP in general, you can go and join uh, those calls. If you send me an email, I can send you an invitation and we can, we can discuss it. But uh, there is a lot of things to do. Yeah, and thank you for, for the question. But uh, of course, later the aim is to handle also this. But it's, uh, it's quite platform dependent, that, that's the problem. If uh, uh, it sends erroneous messages, well, um, well, the data there is no checksum imposed by a message, but in the payload data, the application can do some checksum. 
needed for it. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, well, the aim is to make it uh, generic. And uh, the, the problem with, uh, with uh, reboot or reset uh, is quite platform specific, this as well. So uh, there, there's, yeah, this is quite, uh, you, you are getting to be pretty hot. hot, hot, hot. <laughs> Flow control? Yeah, uh, it is relying on Virtio. So uh, technically, uh, when one uh, when uh, the, there can be like back, back pressure applied, if uh, yeah, okay, yeah, or from application level, you can send some acknowledge if you, if you want and wait for the acknowledge. That depends on the implementation, but if you don't use anything and you just deplete the pool, the master will not refill the pool and it will just run out of the buffers and it will have to have to wait. So, <coughs> effective back pressure, maybe, let's call it like this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can you can reset, but again, this is platform dependent, and yeah, it, it depends on the system. There, there was a question. Yeah. Uh, first message where there is a CRC and how 
block uh, the messages and then uh, messages uh, sending that uh, data are sending other other uh, message and uh, on the other side uh, the CRC is checked and uh, put RBC tools we say all that. Thank you.